What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Weekly Dose of Dano with your host here, Dano, giving you the most fire content that you're going to find on the internet. If you stay for 10 minutes, you're going to stay for the entire episode because we have Jerry Jamat here with this absolute legendary basis. And here he is. Jerry, man, thank you so much for being here. What do you have to say to my positivity posse before we get started today, Jerry? Have a good mate. Have a good time while we wrap here, brother. I love it. I love the great energy. I love your presence. And thank you so much for being here for today. To my positivity posse, thank you for being here on this wonderful Thursday, sharing this energy, sharing this uh, golden nuggets that Jerry has to share with us for today. So everybody, sit back, relax, and welcome to another episode of Weekly Dose of Dinner TV, everybody. Thank you so much to my positivity posse for being here today. Beatrice is so right, right here. She says it, you guys speak for me sometimes. This will be an amazing show. Yes, 100% it will be. Just, just to hear about Jerry's story is absolutely incredible. I mean, the man has over 70 plus years of experience of being in his field and just of, of life experience and wisdom. So I'm so excited to bring Jerry on for today because his story is absolutely amazing. But for before we do that, you already know we got to do. We have to we have to have our time here on Weekly Dose of Dana with me and the Positivity Posse. And I just wanted to share one of the things that has been working with me before we bring Jerry on. Um, that has been working tremendously for me. And you guys are probably or everybody's gonna think that it's you know silly. Um, but and it's so simple, but it works. And it's the power of writing, right? Just if you have a schedule or you have a lot of things that you need to do or you just have some built up anger or aggression or, you know, things that you just want to release from your body and get out of your mind. The power of writing has been absolutely amazing just for me. I mean, in these past, I don't know, week alone or since the last time that we met here on Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Um, just I, I always thought that writing has been like kind of corny or like, ah, I don't really have enough time to do that. Or, you know, I, I'm just so focused on so many other things. I can't sit down and, and sit down to write. Uh, write my schedule or write anything that I need to write down. Uh, but let me tell you, this stuff has been life changing. And as we had, you know, many other guests come on Weekly Dose of Dano to say the power to talk about the power of writing. And when I tell you guys, I, I didn't really fully comprehend it before until you start doing it. That is when you see the great uh, life changing events start to happen. And things have been just been going on the up and up for me. And, and you know, it, it wouldn't be possible without number one, the support from you guys for, from the Positivity Posse, but also um, just, it, it's been absolutely amazing. So if you haven't already, try writing, whether it's writing down uh, song lyrics or writing down what you have to do for the day or just a positive affirmation for yourself, all of it does play a huge role in what manifests in our lives and how we treat ourselves and what transpires from it. So just make sure that you do take that time to write because writing is absolutely amazing. And I'm sold on it. I'm a fan. So that's been my little spiel for you guys in our moment here on Weekly Dose with Dano TV. But now we have to bring on the legend, Jerry Jamai. And when I tell you guys this, when I tell everybody, this gentleman right here is, is just so chock full of energy and great, great wisdom. We need to welcome him with open arms and give him a great, great standing ovation. So everybody, I need you to drop some fire emojis. I need you to drop some hearts. Anything that you have to do to welcome Jerry uh, to the show because it's time to bring Jerry on. Jerry, 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 what are you doing back there, man? Stop playing the bass. It's time to come on to the show.
There he well, is. There he I is. guess I should put it down, huh? Like you said, so I'm playing the bass. <laughs> <laughs> he has it on deck. He has it ready. What did I tell oh, you guys? Yeah, oh, we were just messing around. Um, All right, up. Jerry, let me tell you before we get started today, thank you so much for being here. Your story, when I was going through it, has been absolutely amazing. And like I said, just such such full of wisdom and, and great energy. Um, so let, let's get right into it because I know a, a lot of people that are watching right now live or on the replay, we just want to hear about everything, all of your goods, all of your bads, all your successes, all your failures, and everything in between. So let's just jump right into it. And as everybody knows from the title, you are a two-time Grammy Award-winning musician. And I want to take it back to the very beginning. Did you always know that you were going to be a musician from a very young age, or, or when did you start to know? Well, <clears throat> I don't want to spoil the um, the drama and the exploration of reading my memoirs, um, Make It Happen, which really um, gives the, the time that it needs to really go through it with um, to really understand it. Um, we all get, um, have different gifts, and sometimes we don't find them until um, something, um, you get an epiphany, or like you say, like average, some people get it like that, like you described. When did you know? No, I, did, I didn't know. I had um, a series of um, head injuries before I found out that I wanted to be, um, I had some kind of um, desire to do something. Um, and prior to that, um, I had no desire to do anything with the, um, probably because of the head injuries. Um, you usually want to sleep and eat. That's all you want to do is natural. Um, but I went through my childhood like that. And then when I, um, happened to hear the bass after my, um, most significant one, um, it sounded different to me. And the person playing it was Paul Chambers. Um, and he, uh, really turned me on to like, um, hearing the music and participating in the music. Um, so that was, um, that gave me a life. So for me, it was more than just picking up an instrument and say, oh yeah, I'm good, blah, blah, blah. And for me, it was a lifesaver. And I didn't find that I was good until I started playing it, <laughs> okay? I knew, I knew I wanted to play it, but I had no idea what was gonna come out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It um, but as it turned out, um, I knew something. And I was able to um, communicate what I knew through music to other musicians um, and other singers. And we were able to um, make music um, after my primary um, starting, uh, I guess my, what you call my um, beginning, playing this in local bands. Uh, I started playing at the age of 12 um, when it was called, which comes down, when it's all said and done. That's when I started working. And I was working three, four nights a week. I had the um, head injury at night, when I was nine. So uh, from you can do the math from there. It took me that long to even get to the instrument after I found that I had the desire to play it. I had to wait um, a year. I had to wait a year to start playing it at the age of 10 to 11. I started playing 11. And then I started working at 12, um, nine months after my 12th, my 12th birthday. Wow. Um, and you know, what's amazing about that is that at such a young age, you picked it up and you started working three or four nights. There are people that are out there nowadays that still aren't even getting gigs and maybe they've been playing since about five. So, you know, congratulations on that. And we're going to talk about a few things, you know, that you just mentioned about the head injuries, um, about your book, Make It Happen. But I, I want to touch on something that's pretty important when it comes to mindset. And I was reading this book before. It's called Mindset, believe it or not, by Carol Dweck. And she talks about all the legendary performances and people that are at the top at their fields that a lot of people misconstrue or, or they say the wrong thing to say you're a natural born talent. And that is not what's going to get you to the top. And like you said, you had to work and, and grind there, right? Like in a, a classic example is Michael Jordan. Uh, I believe that's the one that they actually use in the book is he, he didn't he wasn't always great. He had to learn how to be great. So Jerry, can you touch a little bit on that as well? Like what, what did it take for you to learn how to be one of the best, you know, musicians of, of all time? Well, as you, as you um, know it, just to um, go back to where I was, um, I didn't um, I forget that what you're talking about didn't come to much later. I received, I got my stardom at an early time. All my Grammys came in the first um 
10 years of my, um, let me see, 12, yeah, the first um, 10 years of my playing, basically. Um, didn't know a thing, though, because um, if, you, if you read um, um, the great um, saxophone player, Eddie Harris, he made the statement in his book. He says, um, music is the only profession where you can become successful and not know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. So in that case, I would be a poster child for that. Now, you know, there's different levels of knowing. You know, you can level to a certain degree. We can do so much with what you know. And then if you want to go higher, you have to learn something else. But I was able to um, extrapolate what I did know and work with the fact that I couldn't hear and work that into a particular style of music, a style that fit into what I was assigned to do in the recording studio in 1965, um, there, from there on to 1972, 72, three, four, five, six, after that, I had a very short career. Um, but I was able to um, express myself musically. Um, I learned how to play, I learned much more about music when I, um, years later, when I started um, teaching. Um, I had wrote, hit a roadblock where I couldn't, um, I wasn't going any further. I had another accident. So that took me out for a few years and I was completely um, disheveled from that particular point. And my friend Richard Davis suggested I start chanting, Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. Talk about positivity. That entirely changed my life. I gave me a, a sense of uh, confidence and pride that I never had before. Um, I started taking students in. I had been people coming to try to take student lessons from me for years, and I've never, you know, make, make myself available. They were willing to come from a foreign country and stay in a hotel so they can come to visit me for weekly lessons. I mean, it was got to that point. And, 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 and you're saying uh, you're saying this whole time that you don't know what you're doing, and you have people from all the way on the other side of the world coming well, to, to learn from people. you. Well, people are attracted to what they hear. The fact that the person they're hearing doesn't necessarily have to know what they're doing, the fact that they're attracted to it, that's it right there. Now, whether the person can relay that information to them is a wholly different thing. Mm -hmm. If they can be around them and pick up what they can pick up, that's another thing, too. There's a lot of ways of learning. Um, mm -hmm. You can learn by osmosis, just you know, being sitting around the sinks. So some, there's levels of it. So I got been able to um, tell what perfect my teaching technique along the way, which helped my learning because the first thing Richard told me was, if you want to get better playing, start teaching. So I started teaching. This is after he taught me to chant. He, he tells me to start teaching. So he got me on the upward leg to really um, rehabilitate and resuscitate my life that had gone like, you know, south after the last accident, um, which maybe um, I was also able to perform and work with um, people like Fred Jones and Mel Lewis. I did... Um, a lot of things, um, oh, tons of stuff after that, that that you don't you don't see me. I didn't get Grammys for, but I kept on working. I did. I worked with Greg Allman for eight years. I went on the road. I went. Um, Aretha would call me to do. Um, <laughs> Forty years later, Aretha would call me to do a job. So I was doing. I was doing more live performances as opposed to doing um, studio work. And yeah. now I do a mixed bag of both. You know, I do rec I do record sessions, and what you said about writing is so profound. Um, even for me writing out, if I hear a piece of music, if I write it out, I know it better. Uh, if you write out what your thoughts are, you realize your thoughts better. You can get into, you can argue with yourself while writing something out to say, how do I want to say it? So it really brings you, brings out the, um, the best of you when you start trying to put it down on paper and to I share with someone else and, and not and someone you, else just for yourself to help yourself to remember. 100%. Like a shopping and, list. We're, we're going to be talking about all of those things that you just mentioned. Actually, we're going to be talking about uh, later and throughout the episode. So, Jerry, you got to come come back to the present with me, man. You're getting to I know I see it on the smile on your face. You're getting very excited to talk about it. But we will talk about all those things you just mentioned. I promise. Um, but yes, 100 percent. A big thing that people don't understand or that I guess I didn't understand is, is writing is, is so key. So thank you for bringing that point out to everybody as well. But earlier, since we've been on the topic of books, um, you have a book that you just came, I'm not sure if it just came out, but it's called Make It Happen. Uh, can you tell us why you chose to wrote this book and uh, what what can your fans expect from reading this book? Um, they can expect a lot of uh, a good reading. Um, I've, I've been told this was very well written. I, I 
appreciate myself for doing that, putting the time in. It's not my first book. It's about the fifth or sixth book I think I've written, basically, but the only one about my personal life. Everything else was about music and how to um, achieve a level of musicianship other than where from where you were, to increase your ability to learn, basically, um, which is the extension of my Buddhist practice, actually. That's when I started actually writing. So I have something to say that's more like, in terms of um, not only the, the mind, but also the soul and the spirit that drives the mind to do these things and make these wonderful sacrifices to improve so they can share their wisdom and their knowledge with other people and their gifts. That. Yeah, you know, and that's such a big piece of what uh, uh, what we need in life, right? Because when it comes to finding our gifts, like you said, we can go maybe 70 or 80 years or three years to not knowing what our gift actually is. So, yes. so I, I want you to talk about that because that's a recurring theme that keeps uh, coming up. Uh, how did you actually know, or uh, when did you find out that music was your gift? Like, was there an aha moment? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was an aha moment. <laughs> what is? <laughs> Uh, you know, there were aha moments along the way. <laughs> um, you know, first I had to figure out, you know, when I was summoned to play when I was 12. I, a bunch of men heard me playing. They were, the, the leader was 60 years old. The next oldest was the tenor player, Jerry Guerrero. He was 40. The drummer was 30 and I was 12. So I they knew, they spotted the talent that I had and was able to do. So I didn't have to really just think about just just keep on doing what i was doing but in the process of doing that i realized how people were um physically attracted to um musicians myself you know playing how if i moved people in the audience would move i said whoa that's i hadn't i didn't count i hadn't counted on that part of it <laughs> so that was a, the second aha moment and later on when i switched instruments so i went from an acoustic bass to um electric bass, I realized, um, oh yeah, there's something I can do here. And from that point, uh, that was 1965, 1964. And so from that point, I started making records with people as opposed to just playing live and people began, began able, were able to hear my own unique ideas and my interpretation of music. And that's what got, and because I could read music at the same time um, coming in, although in the band I played with who hired me, I didn't have to read nothing. <laughs> I think they had, I think they had, maybe had court charts, or they had lead sheets, but I knew how to read. I mean, so it wasn't like I couldn't read, but it wasn't demanding for me to be reading on a gig, standing on a gig, reading a chart. It wasn't like that. You had to learn it by ear and hope you can get to do the best job possible. And they depended on me to do that. Um, so I and, was able to do that. And here we are um, many years really later, so and you're still doing that now. Uh, so many oh. years later, you're still putting on the best performances um, and, and just living, you know, your best life and lifting out your purpose and expanding on your gifts. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, because if there's somebody that's watching right now that may not know what their gift is, as Jerry just said, you have to do some self-reflection to see, OK, you know, this dot connects with this dot. And sometimes you won't see it, you know, until maybe five years into the future. But if we are conscious and aware right now of those um, things that do start to click, that's when we can start to figure out the puzzle pieces in our life, so to speak. So, Jerry, uh, we just have to play one word from our, our sponsors really quickly. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about the things that you mentioned, um, you know, your professional career, who you worked with and how these events all kind of led to, to where you are today. So we're going to hear a word from our first sponsor and we'll be right back with some more fire content for you guys on Weekly okay. Dose of Dano. Keeping 
God bless this organization. Welcome back to Weekly Dose of Dano, everybody. That was just a quick word from our sponsors at Takes a Village. Thank you so much to Takes a Village Housing for sponsoring Weekly Dose of Dano. And we really do appreciate it as long as the support of the productivity process and the support of these amazing guests, such as Gary, like yourself as well. So, Jerry, I'm going to share this quick video with everybody. And I want you, I'm going to play about maybe a minute, a minute and a half of this. And I want you to tell us when we come back how this all came about. Um, and, and this was actually really awesome that I saw this. So, all right, here it is. I'm going to share the video with everybody. Let me just rewind it. Boom. Let's make it full screen and let's play it. Techno wizard. <laughs> So before we play this out, I just want everybody to see what's going on. So obviously everybody knows Aretha Franklin, the legend right here, but oh. who is this handsome, absolutely talented man in the back? What's going on <laughs> right here? Okay. Wow. So this, wow. The entire time, my apologies, everybody. So here it is. Now that makes oh. sense. <laughs> this is what I wanted to share with you all. I didn't realize that I had to share it on this screen. Because usually with the other service, it came up. But here it is, everybody. We have Aretha Franklin right here singing in 2014 on the David Letterman show. And we have this incredibly awesome, super talented, handsome man in the back. So we're just going to play a minute of this. And Jerry, I want you to talk about um, how this came about. Um, when did you get the call? And uh, just tell us a little bit about this experience. <laughs> For sure. I can see crystal clear. Go ahead and tell me I'm in my lane, ship, man. See how I will be with every part of you. Lord, I need to make the things that I will do. Hang as a fire burning in my heart. Reaching the favorite pitch and it's bringing me out of the dark. The scars of your glory remind me of I can't yeah. help. We almost had it all. The sky is a new love. We keep me breathless. I can't help it. We all so Jerry, I see you jamming back there, and I man. see you jamming on the show right now. So, wow, so tell us about cry, how. That... Man. <laughs> what? Go ahead, tell us about it. Oh man, that was um, that was the call I got from her forty three years after our last date in nineteen seventy one. I was in Germany, um, at a bass camp for Warwick um, music, music, and her regular bass player Ralph Armstrong was talking about a gig he couldn't make with Aretha. And um, I didn't get into, I didn't pay any attention to it. And he took a picture of me, him, Chuck Rainey, and Kevin Brandino, bass master. The four of us, we all played with Aretha during, I was the first one in 1968, and they came on later. Um, and apparently, um, and as she put two into together, I don't know, but she um, had her MD, um hb barnum called me after i got home from germany and um asked me if i was available to the letterman show with aretha two weeks from then <laughs> so, like, well you know why not so i've been 
I've been trying to catch up with it for a long time. We've hit and miss, um, but it's been a, a long time. So um, I accepted the job, and then a week later, calls you back and asks me, um, um, "You have how about a guitar player? A guitar player stranded in Europe? Can you um, get a guitar player also?" I said, uh, <clears throat> "Oh yeah, my man George is in New York because uh, I had moved to California. She might have thought I still lived in New York. It'd been so long." Um, but I called um, I gave him George Naha's number, and um, there we are on the Letterman show, just like that. Wow. And you know, like I said, I didn't I didn't mean to make you cry or get on the verge of tears, <laughs> but you know, when I saw that, that was, clip, I said, What? That's my man good. Jerry in the back, and uh, I just saw you grooving and I had to share that with everybody. Number I appreciate one, that, man. So much yeah. else, one of my final, you know, I really appreciate that moment. Um, uh, that time I spent with her and she 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 just passed away, um, you know, four or four years after that. Um, let's mm -hmm. last yesterday was the 16th of um, the month where I celebrate her passing every 16th as a Buddhist. This is what we do um, on this numbered day of their passing. Uh, but um, she was something, man, quite an inspiration. I mean, she had been my, you know, favorite singer for a, a long time after going through Nina Simone and uh, Vince, um, Billie Holiday. I discovered Aretha Franklin when she was with Columbia. And um, I go in the studio with them doing my sessions and they have a big picture of her in Columbia sitting at the piano. I look and go in there and look up and say, yeah, one day, <laughs> one day came, um, let's say three years later in 68, they called me, um, Jerry Wexler called me to, um, he said, just come down, you might not play, but we want, I want you there just in case. I said, okay, I never taken a job like that before. Or since then, actually, <laughs> I've never. Yeah, I did this with Paul Simon one time. It was similar, but anyway, this was. I um, accepted and showed up two weeks later at the studio, and this was happened to be eleven days after Martin Luther King had gotten assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty heavy in the studio. The studio was packed because you know she's their big artist. He had had seven previous hits on the label, and so everybody in the building was there, coming in, peeking in the studio to see what was going on. And what was going on is we were working on this. They were they were working on a song since ten o'clock in the morning to one o'clock and hadn't hadn't been satisfactory to um, make a record. And at that point, I re I knew when from the ten at ten o'clock in the morning why Jerry actually had me come in. But it took them that long to make you know to okay give us give it a shot. So at two o'clock I went in there and um, laid down a baseline for the song the song called Think which is what they were having um, issues with. And at that point, um, everybody was happy. And I got to leave and Tommy Cogdell told me, hey, no, man, you stay here. You, you, you play the rest of the songs. I said, okay, no Let's problem. do it, yeah. So, and you know, Jerry, what, what that sounds like to me is a classic example of, of, of manifestation, right? Because what you just mentioned before in the beginning of that story was, wow, you looked at her picture of her on the wall at, at the hall at the music college. And you said, wow, you know, I want that to be me one day. And then you totally yeah. forgot about it, right? And that's a big part of manifestation that, oh, yeah. you know, if anybody's... Well, I had, you know, being in my head for years and seeing the picture was um, one thing. And um, ironically, my friend Paul Griffin suggested to Jerry Wesley even get her from Columbia to Atlantic Records. And this mm -hmm. happened years prior to that. So a lot of things were in putting in, put into place, but certainly... Um, the manifestation of um, an idea. I mean, I can tell you a story from another bass player, um, Daryl Daryl Jones, the Rolling Stones bass player. Mm -hmm. He was Miles Davis' bass player um, prior to that. And before he was Miles Davis' bass player, he was just hanging out with Miles Davis' nephew. And one time he went to a show to see Miles Davis play, and he said, oh, I can do that. <laughs> and, and next year, Miles called him. To come to, the, Look at, to come to New York. I love that. And see, everybody you know? that's out there, you may not have the experience or the Instagram followers or whatever it is that you think that you need. It's all already inside of you as well. And when you, Jerry, just mentioned that for both cases, you probably said it as a passing comment and you didn't have that yeah. inner struggle or turmoil to, to push that mm -hmm. manifestation away and you let it happen. Um, so we just have to hear a word from our second sponsors, but thank you so much for sharing that because I think a lot of people can take that advice and that story and really learn from it when, when, when with whatever they're trying to do in their own life sure. as well. So 
we're going to hear a word from our second sponsor. Um, just to give you guys a little heads up, it's going to be me. But, uh, you know, I, I just want to play this for you guys, and we'll be right back after a word uh, from this break for you guys. The legal and emotional journey of divorce and exit a marriage the way you entered it with mindfulness, love. Thank you everybody for being here on this Thursday here with me and Jerry, just to share our golden nuggets with everybody as well. And remember, make sure to like, share, and comment this content so that it can spread to other people. And if you comment, you have your chance to have your questions heard here on Weekly Dose of Dano TV. So Jerry, thank you so much for being here again and sharing all of your golden nuggets. But now I want to talk about um, your professional advice or maybe ideas um, and your experience too. So as you, we just saw, you just had that live, I guess, concert, as, as you can call it. And you do have uh, work in the live, you know, um, performances versus going into the studio and pre-recording your performances. Can you tell us about the difference in the creative process for you when it comes to the live versus recorded performances? Oh, yeah, it's a big difference. Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a subtle difference. You get your experience playing live and you're able to... Um, focus and concentrate in the studio, in a studio environment where everything is pristine and everybody's on best behavior. Um, you want to get out of there in three hours, uh, maybe four. Um, it's a different head, depending on you know, how much, um, whether it's a professional date or it's being a demo date or whether it's going to be a, something where you're going to spend like three days to make one song and you have a budget to do that. Um, so a lot of parameters, but basically what I've, you know, what I got my Grammys for was going in there and, and taking care of business in three hours. Um, and some well, sometimes a double session. With the case of B.B. King, we did um, a couple of days of work. But they were all three-hour union sessions where three hours and an hour extra overtime. Um, was, when we did the we usually did four hours, um, a four-hour session. Um, but one thing you said, I want to just, before I forget, you mentioned how about looking for your gift. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a gift. Um, you have to have this uh, desire to um, express yourself. And you don't have to put any you know, pressure on yourself in terms of where, where it's going or what you're going to do with it um, and whether anybody's even going to like it or not. <laughs> you know, the thing is you want to just, you want to do it for yourself and get the satisfaction. And from that self-satisfaction grows the idea that, well, maybe um, I'm going to do this with somebody else. And maybe when you get with somebody else, maybe somebody else will like it. I mean, things, bands get formed that way. I've never had the opportunity to play in a band like that was formed like that, which is like really, um, you know, my karma, my blessing, whatever it is. Some people let's um, fall in those situations. Um, I was looking, listening to um, the old, um, um, oh, gee, I forget the name of the group. Any, anyway, oh, the, um, the two brothers, the brothers, the um, Charlie Winston. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, his brothers would tune his bass down to some crazy um, notes to get the sounds they were getting. I mean, he was didn't read music, but just played, okay? And he got the sound he wanted. He altered his instrument to get the sound, and he wasn't caring about anybody else but playing with his brother, okay? And they make the Dap Band, the Gap Band. The Gap yeah, band. It, yeah. I, I, they, I love that. Play, hell, hell of a musicians. I mean, tremendous musicians. So, so it's about really um, just, you know, you want to go for it. You want to go for it. If you don't, it's not about, you know, necessarily having, being the best. I work with musicians who were just like, they showed up on time, basically. They were good people. And they want, you know, we wanted to have them around. They weren't some, necessarily the best musicians, but they were just, you know, they were good to be around. They had something good to say, something positive to offer, basically. And that's part of the creative process. 
and that's all you need really too if you have that you know good spirit and you're working on everything that goes on the inside whether it's our yeah. mind or our soul like you like you said um it, it's just going to be a reflection of the outside of everything that's going to happen for you so thank there you for sharing is. that of just having that positive attitude and just something nice to say because you never know um that compliment if you do give somebody something nice to say well that might be the person that you've been looking for whether it's a partner or a business opportunity um it, it'll all come to you but it all starts on the inside and jerry you just mentioned so many um legendary names you know aretha franklin and then bb king um and that's who i'm actually interested to hear about so can you share maybe the most um you know joyful experience that you've ever had working with bb king with, you said with bb king yes um oh all of them they were such a something <laughs> it's funny how we re i just got finished listening to boots the other day and he spoke about how he had encountered james brown <laughs> and he had the same experience i had <laughs> it's a crazy <laughs> he knew a guy who imitated james brown who he played with was a kid and so when he met James Brown, finally, it was like, oh, he's like so and so and so and so. So I had the same experience with B.B. King. I had been working with a, a guitar player named Ray Shinnery, who was a Jamaican musician. Um, he was um, older than I was, obviously. Everybody was older than I was. I remember him coming to my house as I went um, to jam sessions, in fact, um, before I was actually working with him. But... Um, when I started, when I was playing upright bass, in fact, I knew Ray, I knew Ray, Ray a long time. Couldn't have to think about it. But anyway, when I started playing electric bass, I started working with him. And him and um, Honey Boy, Charles Otis, and Leo Morris, the great, fabulous New Orleans drummers. And um, we would um, take um, Ray's music, which was actually B.B. King's music. He sang, he spoke, spoke with a heavy Jamaican brogue. But when he sang, he sounded just like B.B. King. Mm -hmm. So when I finally meet BB King in the studio, I said, he sounds just like Ray. <laughs> and what me and Honey Boy and Leo Morris and Dries Muhammad would do with, with Ray's music was to funk it up. We take, mm -hmm. you know, a ballad and funk it up and make it make it funky. We do something with it out of the ordinary. At some point in the song, we would mess with his music. And he loved it. It was no problem. So when I met BB for the first time and hit the hit factory in 1969 in the summer, um, it was just like, it's like, like, hey, he sound just like Ray. Let's, let's get it. And we yeah. got it. <laughs> and, and, you know, your memory is really good, by the way. Uh, you're just naming the date right on the spot. And, you know, I commend you for that, too, because I, I can't even remember what I had last week for breakfast. So your memory is on point, man. So, so well, congratulations to that. And well, when you write a book, you have to remember, I, I spent I spent the last five, I spent from, 19, from 2016 to 2018 writing the book. And remember everything I've tried to forget for the last 50 years. So wow. <laughs> it's kind of it kind of stuck in there. You know, yeah. I remember things I normally wouldn't even think about trying to remember. In fact, there's a story in my book. <clears throat> I wrote down one thing that I remember from memory. And <laughs> about a, a week before, somewhere close to publication time, I got an uh, email from a friend of mine in Switzerland. He sent me some studio logs from Atlantic Records from 1968. And it describes the session, which I describe in the book of where I got a call at 1030 in the morning from Atlantic Records. And they said the bass player didn't show up. And can I get down there to um, record the session? I said, sure. I got down there and I get down there. What I remembered was Wilson Pickett and Arif Mardin, who, the person who called me. I don't remember nobody else but that. And so in writing the book 50 years later, I'm trying to remember, you know, who was possible. I'm putting like placeholders in to kind of hopefully along the way, somebody, else, somebody, I'll find out who was there. And so I kind of, it never left the book. And so when I got the, the real information, I found out that Ken Curtis was there, um, Carl Lynch was there, Bernard Purdy was there, <laughs> um, um, the Barrett's home play, somebody else there. I can't remember right now, but everybody that was there, I knew. <laughs> yeah. So I had made up names, placeholders to put in there. And what happened was in the publication, both stories are in the book. <laughs> wow. So it goes I, from one to the other. If you know, if you blink, you miss it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
And so everybody watching right now, if you are interested, go support Jerry. The book is called Make It Happen. And it's just an accumulation of his personal stories, not necessarily in the music sense as well. And uh, Jerry, you oh, know- Don't forget, the, the book is, is only on Amazon. Okay, so I'll drop the link for everybody as well right after yeah. the episode so they can go and check it out. And Jerry, one of the questions that's coming up right now is uh, when I was, or when it comes to the, the word, even just musician, there are probably so many musicians out there that we, I mean, you can't really even put a number on them. Have, has there ever been a point or something that's come up that's, that you may have said to yourself, well, you know, there's all these other millions of people that play the bass out there. Um, how am I going to set myself apart? Did you ever have that kind of negative mindset? And did you ever focus on the competition? No, never, never. No, but I was aware of the competition. I mean, I had competition from the time I started playing. I mean, the, my biggest competition was Eddie Gomez. I mean, and you you can see where he went. I mean, he was a star when I met him. And he was the cat who I had to, you know, basically compete with. But I knew what he was doing. What I was trying to do was some, what he was doing, already doing. I was trying to get there. Um, and by means, his articulation, his ability was just off the chart. But the funny thing is, when we got to high school, when I got to high school, he was still in high school also. And um, we auditioned for the All City High School Orchestra. And I had gotten a special teacher from the Met Metropolitan, Met uh, Metropolitan Opera House, Marvin Topolsky was his name, um, a special to help me with my bowing technique because I wanted to um, you know, play in the symphony orchestra, which I had been trained to do from the beginning. So um, I, um, after the our auditions, our um, rehearsals, it turned out that Eddie was not the best one in the city. I was not sure he was going to be number one. He was number two. <laughs> and I was number three. <laughs> oh, so you got you two and three. Who, do you remember who number one was or no? Number one, unforgettable. Number one was a little guy who had a disability. He had a bent frame. He could only get on the stool. He had to come up on the stool. He was, um, you know, malformed in some kind of way. But man, he could play that bass. <laughs> wow. I mean, he was like, he was. Number one in 1962. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing that story, too. And like I said, when it comes to other people, I'm so glad that you never had that mindset to focus on the competitors and to focus on maybe the things that will hold you back. But like you said, you found your passion. You knew that when you were um, playing and you were dis distributing that music, um, it, it just came from a place of love and excitement. And that's really, that's what we have to find more of what we want to do in this world. We got to stop really appeasing um, and live into what other people's standards are for ourselves, but instead live to our own standards. And uh, Jerry, we just got to play one more commercial break from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with, to wrap up everything, um, to hear about some more personal stories, your professional career, and maybe any advice that you have to give for this next generation as well. So we'll be right back after our last and final sponsor. You can navigate the legal and emotional journey of divorce and exit a marriage the way you entered it with mindfulness, love, and respect. Solace Divorce Mediation is a full-service law practice helping couples focus on the health and well-being of children and their forever co-parenting family. Our streamlined divorce journey offers flat fees with an estimated completion time frame of two to four months. If you or a friend need us, visit SolaceDivorce.com. So everybody, that was a word from our last sponsor. And thank you so much for being here on Weekly Dose of Dano TV. And thank you, Jerry, for coming on and sharing your positivity and your life stories as well. Um, I want to share this picture with everybody because I have no idea what this is or what this even means. So Jerry, you're going to have to uh, tell us and, and inform us what solar education is. So let me share this uh, window really quick with, with everyone. And here we go. Uh, Jerry, what are we looking at right here? Let me see if I got to go back and share it. Let's see. I hope it's my color sound wheel. Yeah, it should be, but you know, I don't <laughs> understand why this isn't showing up correctly. Uh, here it is. It just decided to pop up. Ah, <clears throat> that's my uh, 23 year project of working, trying to bring 
Color Sound Music to the fore, where people can actually engage with colors and musical tones and have a connection, either in the musical library, in the photo library, um, a, a pathway to learn music um, using colors. And if you notice, there are 12 colors there, and the original color system only had seven colors, uh, which were the rainbow colors. But you can see depicted here are, you have pink, you have silver, you have turquoise, brown, and gold. Those are the five additional colors I had to add to make the scale complete. So we have 12 tones of music, which is what we hear and what we react to and what we listen to. And we ship the and, um, massage and manipulate to give up different make recreate out of these 12 tones so now i've just assigned colors to those 12 tones that are complete now so this is how you teach music to the uh, younger generations no that's what it, it, it can be taught to the younger generation using this um system this is something i'm proposing and putting out there and hoping to get an app built um created and with this ai going on it's easier than ever to have this my dream come true. So I'm expecting to um, have something emerge in the next um, year, hopefully. And I, I love the Even name, through too. Even through an investor or through a crowdfunding. I love the name. How did you come up with solar energy? Well, that was my, you know, it was my Buddhist practice. Um, that, that changed my life. Um, it's, it's, my, my, my group is called Solar Energy. Um, I just felt something about, you know, the soul and the music. I like soul music. So it was probably a, a no-brainer. And it kind of like the fact that I was able to, music is so, so invasive. It's like chanting nam yo ho ring kyo You're sending this energy into people's lives and they're around the world. They don't even have to hear you. The fact that you're sending it out there, they're getting it. Um, so soul energy I've been using, that was my group's name from 1976. Basically, my first um, group uh, as a um, as a solo performer, and so um, 2000 later on, I met a partner and we started doing some environmental work, and um, we decided to um, call the whole thing Solar Energy, including you know the connection between man to man, blood to blood, the whole idea of you know man taking care of man and taking care of Mother Earth, main thing because we've neglected her so poorly um, over the years, as we're and doing I'm now. Glad you're able yeah, and I'm glad you're able to make that difference and actually come up with this technology and this new way of thinking to, like you said, help your fellow man, help Mother Earth, and to help ourselves as well. So, Jerry, I'm just interested. Uh, we only have a few minutes literally left on the show. Um, I'm interested. What What's your opinion on the state of music nowadays? Do you think it's getting better? Do you think it's the same? Or do you think it's on the decline? Oh, it's, it's probably a little bit of both, you know, depending on which chair you're sitting in. <laughs> which part of the world you're in. Um, as far as, um, you know, America is the most pro 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 proficient uh, purveyor of music. Um, and they listen They listen to what we put out. And it's getting, um, it's, got, it's got to get better. If they keep going back and playing the old com the commercials, play the old songs from the old days, then, you know, some way they're getting the old music filtered into their head by way of commercials, which is great. I love commercials. I mean, 30 seconds, 20 seconds to get your message across. It's the, you know, it's the ultimate of communication. Um, so um, I think it's getting better. You know, it should be. You know, everybody does their part and everybody treats everybody like a human being um, and, and tells the truth. I think that's um, that's a whole nother story. But if they use the medium, use it properly, uh, um, use it more effectively, I think we can probably help the world in some particular point, especially with the state that we're in now. Um, it's going to take more than music, you know, it's a whole rec rec recognition of all the wrongdoing that's been done over the last, you know, century, especially looking at Palestine, 75 years, that's just, that's a drop in the bucket compared to all the other atrocities that have occurred. But it's right in our face right now. Climate change yeah. is in our face right now. Everything's yeah. right, now, right now. It's our job right now to do something. This younger generation that's here, this is the new generation. I mean, this is your, this is your world that we're leaving to you that you have to actually, you know, do something with and make a yeah. change. And it all starts with the music. Like you said, if we can listen to maybe some music that is, you know, self-empowering or, you know, raises our vibrations, because there's things that you can find on YouTube all the time. Um, I literally listen to it every night when it comes to yeah. the positive affirmations and the raise the energy. So if we can Isn't do that, that 
start there. Yeah. Oh man, it, it's really a, a life changing thing, and I know life changing is kind of cliche. Yeah, YouTube is amazing. You can, that's where people are watching right now. Um, yeah, that's but, where you know, it it, the people it, talk about when Napster came out. I think Napster came out. YouTube came out after that. I mean, I saw it. I saw that was it's fan driven. I said, I said that's the future right there. I saw it then that YouTube was going to be a, a big deal. The internet, the whole internet idea, but the fact that YouTube is fan driven. People post stuff up there that I've, you can't even find anymore. You can't even buy anymore. But some fan yeah. has it in their basement and they want to share it. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. You know? Spreading <laughs> you know? the great times. It's them, a, you know, you got yeah. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. You can, and, you know, they have virtual tours now of museums. So everything's all online. But like you said, yeah. it all comes back to uh, how we treat ourselves and how we treat each other. So thank you for sharing that, Jerry. And like I said, we only have a few minutes left. So here's the last question. And we always wrap up every episode on Weekly Dose of Dano the same exact way. So if somebody's watching this right now in their deepest, darkest times and they're not sure how to get out, uh, what advice do you have to give to these people? Um, maybe they're watching or they're not watching. If they're watching and they get tired, you said? Uh, they're in their, like, their deepest, darkest times. Oh, deepest, darkest time. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what advice do you have for them to get out of that funk? Chant nam yo ho renge kyo. That's my deepest, most life fulfilling advice to save my life. Um, you can um, go to my website. You can get clear instructions on to discover true Buddhism. Um, save my life. I'm sure if we sing this video, we have some karmic connection. I'm sure it'll help your life also. Uh, explain a little bit what that is. It's the mystic law of the universe, it's devotion of mind and body to the mystic law which is okay, past and present and future the law of cause and effect which is here and now through your actions or sound vibrations wow wow i love that so everybody that's jerry's advice to you and if you want to go find out more of i i don't i can't even pronounce that what he's saying but you it's, can it's, find it's, it right here on my website it says um discover true buddhism and you got detailed instructions <laughs> okay Boom. here it is I okay. found it. Discovery. Here it is. Cool. So yep. everybody, that's our episode on Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Thank you so much for being here. Go visit Jerry's website. And uh, Jerry, where can people buy uh, Make It Happen? On Amazon. Solely on Amazon. You can get Kindle version oh. or the paperback version. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today on Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Uh, next week, as you already know, is Thanksgiving, so I don't think I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be here because uh, I'm gonna be uh -oh. enjoying dinner with my family. But uh, I hope you guys have a really awesome Thanksgiving filled with you know much love, an abundance of food, and abundance of uh, prosperity. If you decide to win the lottery on that day, um, so everybody have a great, safe weekend. Uh, Jerry, what do you have to say to everybody before we sign off? Well, Thanksgiving seems to be starting already a week early. This is really, um, to express your gratitude is a wonderful thing. A time of expressing gratitude. Um, keep it going. You're doing a great job, Dan. So um, love the show. Love your audience. And I hope they um, respond. And um, everybody enjoy. And um, keep on expressing that gratitude and, gratitude and that positive energy. There it is. I couldn't have said it better myself. So everybody, go stuff your stomachs and go stuff yourselves with some good, positive music. Um, you, you, you never know. Jerry might have wrote one of the pieces of music that you're going to be listening to this weekend. So everybody, oh, sure. uh, yeah, we'll be back in two weeks. And I hope you have a very safe holiday season and a holiday weekend. And be very safe this weekend. And I'll see you guys in two weeks for another episode of Weekly Dose of Dano TV. Have a great night, everybody. You can navigate the legal...